Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Boyce. I am the CEO of a company called Array Behavioral Care. And I've got two great colleagues who are going to share their thoughts with us today. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Dennis Morrison on the line with us. Uh, Dr. Morrison, you want to say hello? Give us maybe 30 seconds on your professional background. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Denny Morrison. I'm a psychologist by training. I moved into management a long time ago. Ran a community mental health center for 13 years and a behavioral health research institute for four. Served as the first chief clinical officer for a company called NetSmart that sells behavioral health care EHRs, uh, the largest provider in that space. About four years ago, I resurrected my consulting practice and uh, flipped NetSmart to be a consulting client of mine, as well as uh, uh, several others, including Elios who I'm representing here today. Uh, and my background has been kind of, uh, career, my career has probably been best exemplified by saying I lived kind of at the, at the intersection of clinical and technology stuff for a very long time. My mental health center was a very early adopter for EHRs and we won the Davies Award for best implementation of electronic health records. So it have been kind of living at this intersection of technology and uh, clinical care. So thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Um, most of you want to come up and introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, very nice to meet you. My name is uh, Dr. Mosul Rami. I'm a medical doctor. I did a PhD in neuroscience and postdoc in computational uh, neuropsychiatry. Uh, I'm a co founder and CEO of OPT, uh, an online psychotherapy tool uh, which is based on. Uh, the research of my wife, so she's the brain behind it. She has been doing research on the living online psychotherapy since 2007. Uh, in 2015, I helped her uh, to just uh, move from emails to a platform that is, she can securely interact with her patients, work on the background, and uh, three years ago, I decided to join a full time in the company, bring my background in precision measurement and evidence-based uh, decision-making uh, combined with her clinical expertise uh, to make up. See, I told you it was a smart group, right? <laughs> like, um, so uh, Complex of Interest, we all have relationships with these commercial organizations. Um, and I'll just get us kicked off here a little bit um, with a, a premise that we feel like there's been a lot of change in the telebehavioral health, digital mental health space, particularly over the last two years. And I think there's no one way of thinking about what has happened in this space, but there's been a lot of activity. Um, these are six trends that I personally think about, ways that I find helpful to sort of group what's been happening around us. One, we've seen a lot of these big telemedicine platforms like really expand their behavioral capabilities. We've seen a lot of outpatient behavioral centers consolidate and then embrace and add telehealth as a, a big offering themselves. We feel like we've seen the employee wellness and the EAP like really get reimagined. Um, things like Ginger Lira, things like that. Um, there have been a lot of direct consumer kind of platforms that have gotten created and have packaged up and created kind of subscription products of behavioral health. There's been a tremendous amount of great technology coming in here, creating lots of different types of tools. And I think that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. And our sense is basically that like every independent practice embrace video visits, right? Like every clinician is now doing some form of, of telebehavioral health uh, more than not. Our sense is that while this is good and it's moving in the right direction, it has the potential to create a lot of confusion in the minds of the patients, the consumers that we're serving. Um, and in the minds of the providers. I'm trying to figure out how do I navigate what's the right option for me? Um, you know, it wasn't long ago that there weren't many options. Now there are a lot of options. And what we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about is like, what are some of the categories or different types of those options? And how does a consumer or a provider make a good informed decision on what might, uh, what might fit with them? Um, so I want to give the floor back to um, Dr. Morrison to, uh, oh no, I'm going to give it to you next, uh, to just give a little bit more background on your organization. It's definitely not commercial, but we feel like it's helpful uh, to understand kind of what these organizations do uh, and the perspective that they're bringing into the, the conversation. 
by the way, guys, we really want this to be a dialogue, right? We're a really small group. Um, you know, so like, please don't feel like this is a presentation. You can't chime in along the way with, with questions or comments. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I'm sure everybody here knows somebody with, who has struggled with mental health problems. And chances are that you know somebody who has lost their life uh, to mental health problems. Uh, but, you know, uh, you also know probably people living with uh, diabetes. I mean, I live with diabetes myself, right? Uh, but chances are that you don't know anybody who has lost a limb or an eyesight to diabetes. And that is because of uh, the huge, uh, you know, the progress that we had in managing many other chronic diseases. Like over the last hundred years, we went from discovering insulin to extracting uh, insulin from uh, beef and, uh, and pork liver to, uh, you know, mass production of human insulin. And that made sure that my fate as a diabetic patient is different from you know, my great uncles who lost his eyesight and died before 10 years old. Right? In fact, uh, since I was born in 1980, uh, the rate of uh, diabetes complications like uh, lost life or limb has uh, you know, shrunk to one third of what it was uh, in uh, 1980. But in, uh, what happened in uh, you know, mental health space is in completely opposite direction. Actually, the rate of uh, you know, death due to mental health problems has doubled uh, you know, since 1980. And so the, the question uh, becomes that they, what, there should be something fundamentally different from, from what we do and the, all the progress that we have made in managing other chronic diseases to you know, us doing exactly what we did in 19th century, but instead of uh, doing it in a room, doing it in Zoom, right? You know, I call it room to Zoom uh, condition. And that is uh, you know, a little deeper. And if we ever want to solve that problem, you know, we cannot do uh, the same thing that we were doing, which was not progressing, but incrementally better. Yes, you know, doing it. Um, you know, do a Zoom definitely increases the access. But there are challenges that we haven't addressed yet. You know, the problem is that mental health problems are crude and ill-defined. What we call the depression is not one disease. It's essentially 10 diseases like packed in under the same umbrella. And trying to find a, a solution and a treatment for the uh, depression is essentially is trying to find the solution for coughing Without addressing, you know, many different uh, pathophysiologies underlying the cause, it could be asthma, it could be, you know, uh, hypersensitivity, it could be cancer, right? Yes, you can find a medication that temporarily remove the cough, and for some that might be enough. But if you don't, uh, you know, cure the cancer, <laughs> that cough is going to come back, right? So. For uh, the first thing is that as long as this uh, problem is ill, you know, uh, we have not a good definition for the mental health problems, the treatments that we come up with are ineffective and uh, essentially uh, non specific. The same reason that, uh, so not being, uh, uh, you know, the, being crude and ill defined means that the diagnosis and the treatments that uh, we come up with are subjective, meaning that, uh, you know, it all depends. Now, you cannot define some outcome and say, okay, this is the outcome that I want to get to. And, uh, you know, if this person's uh, treatment is going to get there or not. And at the same time, being subjective means that it is a lot dependent on the expertise of the clinician. You have somebody with 20 years of experience who is doing an amazing job, and then you have another person who's coming up two or more years um, out of uh, the school. and you know, it's like 50 50, you know, they might get better or not. And being subjective, man, lack of automation means that it's labor intensive, meaning that, uh, you know, uh, you have a limited capacity to deliver care, and that care is quite expensive. And, you know, we have, we have spent around $250 billion a year in managing mental health problems. Yet more than uh, 40 million of the 60 million people in need do not receive any care for their problem. 
And finally, it is reactive and disjointed. You know, mental health problems are chronic disease problems, but we treat them like uh, an infectious disease or broken heart. You know, we just, okay, you have depression, you can't, I give you therapy, I give you medication, you go again and come back three years later. It is as if, you know, the diabetic patient comes in the coma, we address the coma now, and we tell them, okay, go back, knowing that they will come back in two years uh, with the same uh, problem, if not earlier. So what we have tried uh, to do is to use data and um, AI to actually address this. So we have uh, been trying to uh, come up uh, with a range of disease-specific and clinically valid digital care plans to make the process more uh, efficient and streamlined and use uh, different AI capabilities and data capabilities to make uh, the, the treatments and diagnosis more objective and at the end of the day, make it more personalized and uh, more uh, to each uh, individual patient's needs. So as a result, we would like to you know, to deliver quality mental health at a scale. Um, we won uh, the Mental Health Innovation Zone Award uh, from the American Psychiatric Association in 2018. We were uh, selected as a quarter finalist for the US Self Health Award. My chief medical officer and myself have been commissioned by Springer Nature to write the first handbook on how to do online CBT. So we have literally written the book on this and we have um, more than 10 peer-reviewed articles on uh, the range of uh, um, uh, the efficacy of our solution in a range of diseases. Oh, and uh, the most important part about the, the company is the team. You know, we are not a team of developers that suddenly decided that we want to solve the mental health problem of the world. Uh, it, this is out of um, clinic and research uh, based uh, product. Uh, I introduced myself, our chief medical officer, which is my wife, is the chief psychiatrist at Queen's University. She's a pioneer in the field with uh, 14 years of uh, experience in this uh, field. Our uh, chief data scientist, Dr. Shirazi, she's a medical, uh, he's a medical doctor like us, and he has a um, PhD in. Uh, physics and complex materials and stuff like that. And we have an amazing team of um, healthcare veterans helping us, you know, to, I, I didn't sell a pen, you know, before I started this company. Uh, so naturally they are, they are helping us, you know, uh, commercialize this model. And you know, we have uh, had the chance to work with amazing uh, incubators like DMZ and Morgan Stanley uh, Multicultural Innovation Lab. Uh, to help, you know, learn and uh, what we don't know and how to handle them. Uh, yeah, thank you. Great. Dr. Morrison, you want to give us two minutes on uh, the EOS? I don't know. I just, I just wonder how you think models like this affect the fact that, you know, I'm a social worker. It's already profession that gets, like, very little respect. We're doing, like, most of the therapy on the ground. And then you kind of come in and say, well, like, all right, what you're doing, it's imprecise, and it kind of sucks, and we've got to have, a, like, a digital method that's going to do it better than me. Oh, no. Because <laughs> uh, that's what it sounds like. No, okay. <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, so, actually, this is uh, one of my, uh, uh, the way we see ourselves uh, is a tool. Mm -hmm. It's a medical tool. Mm -hmm. um, an ultrasound machine. It's not replacing a medical doctor or any technician to actually make the diagnosis uh -huh. or make the treatment. It is a tool for them to do their job better, right? So it's not that you know people are doing something bad uh, because you know they are inherently don't know what to do. The point is that when we chop up everything under the same uh, thing, like my postdoc was literally in uh, you know the role of norepinephrine mm -hmm. in uh, mood disorders. Interestingly, uh, like, um, you can see that increased uh, the, you know, uh, norepinephrine uh, secretion causes you know, mood disorders, decreased you know, uh, causes mood disorders, and then we treat them all at the same time, the same way. <laughs> it, it cannot be. It is not the way uh, you know, uh, the rest of the medicine has progress. The rest of medicine is an evidence base that, you know, okay, we actually get a uh, blood uh, you know, test, you know, your uh, WBC is up, okay, you know, uh, do uh, give antibiotics. This is work. No, then we go to the next thing. So 
the challenge is that we cannot put it uh, as this crude thing and try to uh, address it all. Uh, it's the need, uh, we need to be more specific. And that is not a shade on the people who, uh, you know, try to practice it. It is a lack of enough technology. You know, it's the same thing as, you know, X-ray and ultrasound machine, none of them are supposed to replace the conditions. All of them are supposed to be an extension of the clinicians to what they do better. I mean, I think it's an excellent point to come out early in the conversation. Um, this, I, I imagine that we would all agree there is a massive imbalance in supply and demand in the area of medical care, right? Um, and there simply is no way that the existing pool of licensed clinicians can serve everyone using existing models of care. And so I think that's one of the reasons that we've seen all this change happen over the last couple of years. It's like, how do we address this fundamental supply demand balance? And I think there are instances where there are technologies and tools and options that are out there that are designed to augment what the licensed clinician is doing. I think there are some tools that are out there that are designed to, in some instances, replace what some of those licensed clinicians are doing. And I think today might be an opportunity to kind of flush out some of those, those categories. Um, Dr. Morrison, you want to jump in here and give us a quick summary of the Elios background? Yeah, you bet. I did. I did want to. Uh, I only heard part of the question there, but I did. I do think it speaks to kind of an issue that's that's pervasive throughout all of healthcare, and that is what is the role of, of artificial intelligence uh, relative to clinicians' jobs, and will they be replaced? And we've heard this not just in behavioral healthcare, but in radiology, dermatology, and other areas. And I think the American Medical Association was onto something when they re they recently recommended that instead of referring to this as uh, artificial intelligence, that we think of it as augmented intelligence, because the whole point of it is to help clinicians get better, replace some of those mundane tasks that clinicians don't have to do with some technology to give them insights and let them focus what on what on what only a clinician can do. So I think, but the point's well taken that we oftentimes think of this as. Oh my God! Here come here come the ro here come the robots. You know we're all going to be out of jobs and it's going to be all over. It's like not that's not the case at all. I mean, you think about the many things that that go on in your life that that have gotten better because of technology that have given you information to help make better decisions. Uh, I don't know about you when I go into into uh, on Amazon. You know it's it's kind of spooky, but it's kind of, it is helpful. Like when I go to buy a book. And, they, and the algorithm runs through and says, okay, if you like that book, you might like these other three. That's what's running in the background there is a really sophisticated algorithm. Now, keep in mind that Amazon is not making me buy that book. It's just saying, here's something you might like. And this is somewhat similar to that in, the, in terms of augmented intelligence. The goal is to help, cl help give clinicians better information to be better clinicians tomorrow than they are today. That's kind of the whole whole goal of it. So I did want to comment on that that point because I think it is a, an important one, not just for behavioral health, but all of healthcare. But a little bit about Elios. Um, I'm I am uh, an advisor to Elios. The founders. Uh, the uh, if I, I can't see the slide, so I'm, I think you're looking at a slide of uh, headshots. The top three across the uh, the top there are Elion Joffe. Uh, Dora Zaid and Alan Rob uh, Rabinovich. Those th all three of those guys are the founders, and they were um, all of them were in the Israeli Defense Force and had personal experiences with uh, poor mental health being delivered, both in terms of the the soldiers under their commands and also in their personal lives. So uh, w and they got together and said, "There's got to be some a better way to do this. There has to be some better tools," and that's what caused them to form Elios. Now. Um, I'm, I think, and this is, I don't, I think this is kind of borne out in the literature, but I think behavioral health is probably the single best use case for telemedicine. Um, it, it, you really don't have to have hands on to do tele, telebehavioral health. So it, it's a kind of a natural for behavioral health to start being able to address some of the, some of the challenges in the, the behavioral health system. Uh, COVID, of course, caused everybody to fast pivot and behavioral health care uh, like everybody else did that. And so I think, the thing, you know, the next big challenge is going to be, you know, the genie is out of the box. We're not going to go back. So what part is telebehavioral health going to be play in the healthcare continuum once we can see people in person again? And because we did, we, the data do show that some people did better 
with uh, online services than they did in face-to-face -face services. And certainly the adherence rates were higher because you didn't have the friction of having to drive to the office and wait in the waiting room and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so but for some other, other people, telebehavioral health was not the best solution. So I think the big challenge going forward is gonna be who, which, what's best for most? And that's what we're gonna have to figure out. Um, in terms of uh, uh, Elios, can we go to the next slide? Elios is, is, a, is a platform that if I, if I had to describe it, I would, I would describe it as an augmented intelligence decision support system. And what it does is it helps give clinicians information about the session that they just did in real time or near real time. Um, they, the Elios is a real company, uh, like a lot of startups. I, uh, as a consultant, I get pinged by a lot of, a lot of consulting groups. And sometimes, uh, oftentimes these are there when they say, we'd like you to help us. We want to go. We've got an app for behavioral healthcare or something. And, uh, invariably, uh, that, and a lot of these things are nothing but great ideas. There's no, there's nothing there. Um, Elios is a real company. They want, they're on their second round of VC funding. Um, they're, uh, they have been, uh, there you go. Thank you. They have been, um, uh, really, they've really done a nice job of kind of, uh, penetrating the behavioral healthcare market, both in Israel and in the U S they have offices in both, both countries. Uh, their, uh, their U S offices, uh, just outside of Boston. Um, they're, so what they're, when they, when they go in, um, their job is to use natural language understanding an extension of natural language processing. Um, to be able to take the verbiage that occurs during a psychotherapy session, analyze it, and give the clinician insights into that session that were not obvious. So things like uh, what percentage of the time did this clinician talk? What percentage of the time did the, the client talk? Uh, what evidence-based treatments were used during the session? Um, uh, what, were, what were the common themes? What emotions were most often spoken about? in that session. And the real hook for clinicians is that it writes the progress note for you. So if you're, if you're a clinician, uh, and I don't mean, I mean of any ilk, uh, you know, documentation is the bane of our existence. Nobody got into this business because they like documenting what they did. They like doing what they did, but nobody likes to sit down and, and enter the data in the EHR. Elios writes the, the progress note for you. Um, and like all, and all, all of these things, best practice is for the clinician to take that as a as a draft, edit it as necessary before it goes into the EHR, and they build APIs that automatically integrate it into the EHR for the clinician. So, um, so actually, Elios will actually, can, depending on how the setup is, it will actually sit resident in the EHR as a button on the EHR. They click on that, record the session, and it goes. It runs the the session runs through uh, Elios's AI engine, and the the results come back. And there's also a supervisor review that summarizes for a supervisor how are all of their supervisees are doing compared to each other in terms of clinical outcomes and all the, any other indicators that they have identified as important. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, you know, and, and go ahead, let's go ahead and open them. Yeah, thank you. Um, when you think about um, things like radiology or dermatology, the, the uh, those are some of the biggest areas for artificial intelligence. And what, um, and what they have in common is pattern recognition. Um, you know, when you look at a radiology scan or you look at an X-ray or an MRI, those are images and teaching an AI tool uh, through machine learning to be able to recognize certain things. So let's, for example, use uh, breast cancer to use uh, AI to identify a lesion in the breast cancer because it looks a certain way and you train it on enough uh, images like that that it starts getting very high probability hits that says, yeah, there's a 97% chance that this is in fact a lesion rather than just uh, uh, just uh, some benign problem. Well, in, in behavioral healthcare, the, the verbiage, the conversation is the equivalent of those, of those images. And so, the the challenge for behavioral health care is how we have we have a ton a ton of data <coughs> excuse me a ton of data when, when it comes to um, clinical notes and all of that data is embedded in there and that's where natural language processing as a as an AI tool comes in to be able to analyze that 
either in print form or in the case of Elios in verbal form. So to take first you do image, image or uh, do uh, language recognition and then language analysis of what you've identified to be able to give that kind of robust content that is provided to the clinician that that analyzes the session. And so you know you get you get very interesting things happen like you ask a clinician what percentage of the time in this past session did you talk versus the client and almost invariably they'll say well, it was about 50 50 and you know and oftentimes it's the clinician doesn't realize that they're and kind of getting into monologues and that it's really a 70 20 or 70 30 split so these kind of insights are gained by analyzing these things that are really tough to to uh, to analyze um, natural language processing uh, is arguably one of the most labor intensive and difficult things to analyze in artificial intelligence because language is so much like thinking. Um, as opposed to image recognition, you can show enough images to a uh, in, in a machine learning environment so that the that the AI can actually pick out certain things. But language is much more intangible, and that that is one of the things that makes it tough. So. Uh, 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 um, Elios is the first company I've seen who's actually been able to do this successfully. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So the, the point of this is you analyze the session. Uh, the, the results of this are actually quite good. The um, outcomes improve, documentation is reduced, compliance to clinical regimens is increased, uh, compliance risk is decreased. And it's based on the based on that process that I just mentioned to you with a, an analysis of a verbal uh, exchange between client and uh, and clinician. Uh, so I'll stop there. I guess it goes it goes back to most. Oh, this is this is good. I'd love to um, you know just just talk more, right? Um, you know, some of our discussion questions that that uh, people are really here are. This question of like, how do we categorize the different types of technologies and solutions that are out there? Dr. Morrison, I don't, I don't know if from the prior slide, um, it'd be safe to say that you guys are thinking about, hey, there's technology that's out there to deliver care. There's technology improvements that are out there to doc improve the documentation um, of that care. And then there's technologies that are there to improve the different clinical workflows and to augment those clinical workflows. Is that is that a yeah. comparison? You would yeah. and I think there are there are those things that are independent of the clinical intervention. So things like asynchronous tools, like uh, CBT apps on on a, on a phone, for example, those are kind of like a whole other category of asynchronous integration with uh, with care. Where where I see a big challenge is um, a lot of these apps are developed kind of uh, in in isolation, and Oh, and it's fine if that's fine if the if the patient or client is not in therapy. But if they are in therapy, somehow the data from those asynchronous apps needs to be integrated into the electronic record, or somehow fed back to the clinician. Because uh, especially if the clinician prescribed that, there the there needs that that's another chunk of data that the clinician needs to have access to to know how it's going. So if I'm if I'm seeing Jeffrey for depression and Let's say we get to the point where, you know, I'm saying, look, let, let's decrease the number of times I see you per, in face to face. I want you to start using the CBT app for depression. <coughs> Pardon me. And then, um, but I need to know how that's going. You know, if I'm only going to see you once a month and I'm going to rely on that app, then that, that oftentimes is, is an afterthought in the uh, app development um, industry. But the point is, yeah, there are lots of different ways in which this, this, these kind of uh, technologies can assist clinicians and clients to do, you know, to do to get better. How do you categorize the different types of technologies that are now out there for consumers and providers? So, uh, you know, the one goes to you know, some. Asynchronize to synchronize, you know, as uh, Dr. Morrison said. Uh, then, uh, with the, even asynchronize everything, you know, they're self guided, you know, and so you give content to patients to just go and consume. And uh, then you have some supervised uh, solution. Uh, the challenge with the self guided is that most of the time, uh, 
there is very low patient compliance. Uh, like majority of uh, the self-guided solutions, the uh, the, uh, the the compliance after session four is like less than twenty percent. Like eighty percent of uh, the you know, patients who have started using one of these self-guided solutions drop out before finishing the first you know, like the you know, fourth session. Right. So that is a challenge uh, that we uh, see, and that's uh, you know that's why we think that there should be uh, supervision always included. But that supervision doesn't need to be as uh, you know uh, comprehensive. Like you know, you the CBT has been established and uh, for uh, more than twenty years. It's very well uh, you know um, you know known as that okay you are going to teach you this technique this session right and that technique mostly is the same when i explain it to jeffrey and mosan and somebody else right that doesn't matter so there shouldn't be a need for the person to repeat the same general concepts across multiple patients right we have technologies that they care uh, can take care of those what we really need the clinicians for are those parts that they provide personalized feedback, which is very important, right? So the idea is that what we have been trying to do is to say, you know, we have this hybrid model that the clinician assign, we have a range of diseases specific digital care plans, the clinician assign the session to the patient, patients go through the content on their own time. At the end, there is a homework. They do the homework and the clinicians would only provide personalized feedback on the uh, patient's home. This way they can handle three to four patients in one hour uh, rather than just one patient, whether they are doing it asynchronously as a written comment or booking a 20 minute uh, visit uh, with them because the patient has consumed the content. Like what so some of the things that we see is that, you know, you explain something to the patient and the patient is sitting there and trying to absorb what you say and kind of contemplate and everything and uh, should come up with a question right there. What we see in our uh, solution is that patients actually go and read it once, and they come back the day uh, later to read it again and uh, do their homework. So it shows that they have done the contemplation. So they come to the session with the specific questions, and the clinicians have read the homework, so they have a specific uh, uh, you know, uh, feedback. So that allows for a very you know technology augmented way that makes sure that a high quality of care is delivered. And what we have seen in our solution is that because there is always that uh, accountability that I know that somebody is reading this and they're going to comment for me. On average, uh, usually our CBT modules are like 12, uh, 9 to 12 sessions. And on average, each patient completes eight sessions and half of the patients complete the whole month of therapy. And that is because of the role of the clinician, which is there, and they feel that connection. You know, they're not, the, clinic, the patient is not talking to you in the role. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, the best thing that seems to have been coming out in the last two years is uh, this uh, collaborative care model that uh, becoming more and more, I'm like, hear more and more about it so which it seems to be the exact right approach that you know a patient it should be one person's responsibility you know there should be a team you know there should be the, the primary care uh, doctor there should be a psychologist if needed a psychiatrist that they can coordinate the care you know together and um, you know get involved when each of them are needed Dr. Morrison, um, I think we were just touching on a point of uh, basically making the live session for the interaction with the clinician more efficient uh, because the patient is coming into it with some level of preparation, contemplation, having having done homework, whatnot. Are are you seeing similar things? Um, and what do you see as the the outcome of that with the the clinicians and the overall efficacy of their their work? Yeah, I, I, I was really pleased to hear most of them talk about how the adherence goes up when you have clinician involvement. That's I think that's really been one of the errors that, that these these app folks have done where they it's kind of like we'll put up an app and we'll just give it to people 
and they'll use it. And, and he's right. The adherence rate is horrible for those things after about the fourth session. So, you know, adherence is a huge problem in, behavior, in all of healthcare, period, no matter what. So that's one of those problems that I'm glad to hear that they're addressing. And I do think it's that engagement part by the clinician that's doing that. I think that's the, that's the secret sauce to that. Because it really isn't. I mean, it may. It's. I think the reason people engage for those first four sessions or so is because of uniqueness and it's kind of a toy and it's <clears throat> it's interesting. But as most mentioned, there's no accountability. There's no kind of clinical follow through. There's nobody kind of attending to the fact that I'm doing this or not. And I think it it kind of presumes a lot on the part of a patient to say, "I'm going to give you this app and you'll go do it and use it to get better." Like that's, that's, that's a heavy lift, I think. So um, <clears throat> I do think that there's a lot uh, about that, that relationship. Um, you know, in, in traditional behavioral healthcare, we know that 30% of clinical outcomes can only be attributed to the quality of the therapeutic relationship. That's been true for, for you know, 30 years now. And so the, the big question with any virtual environment is gonna be, can we replicate that therapeutic relationship sufficiently to keep to not lose that 30 percent of, of outcome variance and <coughs> pardon me um i'm coming i'm coming off a case of covid so I, <laughs> I apologize for coughing so much um the the but the problem you know the the engaging people with with uh with these apps and online tools um i think that's that's going to be kind of like the secret sauce as we go forward to help them uh replicate that 30% of clinical outcomes and, and, and rep that, that relationship. But, but that's, that's tricky because we haven't really been, we haven't really been testing that. Um, Mosin's kind of position on that by just going to keep making sure that there is clinical supervision and clinical involvement in that process is, is, a, is a really good way to do that. Well, I know we're going to be cognizant of time and we didn't get enough time to do the subject justice, but I um, want to ask one more question of each of you, right? It sounds like the uh, sort of relationship between the clinician and the technology uh, and then the way that the consumer is brought into that is, is what we think is one of the pieces of success here. What is one, maybe two pieces of, of advice that either of you might give to a clinician on how to choose or use the right technology that enhances, that they can, they can have the right relationship with? Um, I, I can think of one or two. Uh, one is definitely the clinical validation, right? The same, it, it, it's important to remember that mental health is part of health. And we should keep it at the, with the same rigor that we check every other practice of medicine, right? We are not doing anything, just something shady that we found on the internet and put it in the patient, right? We don't do that. And we shouldn't be the same uh, in, in mental health. Not everything, every content has been, um, you know, designed uh, the same. What we have been trying to do is that we wanted to make sure that every uh, content, digital content that we put up is connected to a clinical trial, is connected to a peer reviewed article. So you know that we actually went through each uh, you know, module that we put up, it takes a year and a half the process to prepare it. You know, we have uh, you know, uh, sessions, uh, you know, talk to the patients, you know, design, then talk again to the patient, then put it in the clinical trial. So, Having the clinical validity is uh, you know, one important part. And the second part is that, uh, you know, it, it is important that what you use is designed for you with you in mind, right? Um, a lot of times, you know, we, we have had that uh, assumption. We went and said, oh, let's do this. And we go and it's like, we don't care about this or we don't use this, right? So why should there be those uh, features? And uh, the, the EMR experience, I think, shows you know all, all the people dread using EMRs because they're horrible. You know the 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 interaction, the UI UX is you know it, it seems that most of them looked at being designed at the time of dust. You know pre two thousand, and it's such a horrible experience. 
and you compare that to you know something that Apple designs or anything like that. If there is a tool that we are using for delivering healthcare, it should have a similar uh, you know capability. So it wouldn't be a dread using it. It should be a tool that you feel comfortable using it. Uh, you know, all across the way. So great points about clinical validation, um, and then about making sure that the technology is designed to contemplate the experience of the clinician, right? And I think that's that's something I would echo we've seen time and time again a bunch of technologies that have really shiny bells and whistles that are consumer oriented which can be great but they might not contemplate the clinician's experience um, or the healthcare administrator's experience right um, you got to do a lot of stuff on the back end to keep uh, this whole whole wheel of healthcare uh, going so great points uh dr morrison final pieces of advice or tips for clinicians trying to figure out what technology they should or should not bring into their practice? Yeah, I think, you know, the efficacy issue is actually core. And I think uh, American Psychiatric Association has actually published criteria to determine efficacy of apps and online tools. That's a really good resource to look at. And there are some published um, uh, reviews of various things, of various apps, and, and the data is not very encouraging in terms of how many of those have actually based their integration and their, I'm sorry, their development on actual research that, um, that shows that they do, do, they do what they purport to do. Um, uh, the other thing is the, is kind of integration with the clinical workflow. I think it's similar to what Motion was saying that the, um, the, the, we think about these in terms of these things are oftentimes developed by non-clinicians and not with a clinician eye. And so we don't see that kind of, um, the attention to that kind of thing. But, but also there's, there's gotta be, somebody's gotta answer the question, what's in it for me as a clinician to use this tool? And uh, oftentimes they don't, we don't do that. I mean, it's like, here's a great uh, ICBT app. Okay, okay, why would, I, why would I as a clinician wanna use that? What's, what's the payoff for me? And I, don't, and I don't mean to be selfish about that. It's like, but if, if this is something I have to do in addition to everything else I have to do, it ain't gonna happen. So identifying how you integrate these things into the workflow of a clinician and get the data streams set up so that there's an interactivity here between what the client is doing on an app or some online tool and what what are they what's the clinician need to help do their job better that's kind of the real secret sauce i, I think uh implementation science is such that um it's it, paying attention to how you implement stuff is as important as what you're implementing a lot of, a lot of, uh, I, I personally, I found that behavioral health as an industry is not very amenable to change. Uh, interestingly, that they as a, as a as an industry, they're in the change management business, but they don't change very easily. And uh, I can't speculate on why that is, but it just seems to be the case. So there's got to be some work done, uh, both in terms of the kind of the implementation component of this, but also in an organization from the leadership perspective that whoever is in charge has to be has to treat these things as strategic initiatives not technology plays um, you're you're looking at changing the way your clinicians do business but you can't just say this is like implementing microsoft office this is very different than that and so and that sometimes the the missing piece of this is having somebody in a leadership role being able to say Look, you know, this is this is the way we're going to do business now. You have to do this. It's not, and, and that's not an easy job, but that's the job of leaders to do that. Um, and then finally, I think the, the point about integration with other 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 types of healthcare, um, it's that really is the future, as Mosin said. That's where it's all going. And you know, we we have we've got to get out of these silos of behavioral health care is over here and medical medical care is over here, and that's just not going to fly anymore. And the data shows that. When you don't do that, um, people get better. It's <laughs> astounding, you know, treating the person as a person rather than you know, their head versus their body. It's, it's <laughs> who would have thought? So th those are my thoughts. Thank you. Well, I know we're at time. I don't have to run. Anybody who wants to run can, but if people have other questions for these very smart people, um, please throw them out there. I know I'm happy to stick around. Great. Well, I would just offer like an insight for me. For, for me, as a social worker working in a you know a health system, 
there's a lot of times where I do think mental health is represented as not wanting to change. But when they're actually looking for circumstances, a lot of times they were never brought into the change process. It was more, you know, these health systems are run by doctors and they're run by, you know, administrators. And then this change is given to mental health and then they have to react as opposed to bringing in social workers and other mental health professionals during the change process. Yeah, I think, well, that's, and that's just, you know, good, that's just good change management, you know, to bring in the, you know, the stakeholders that have something to say about it. And, I, and that does happen a lot of times, particularly in medical, medical centers. I, I, I remember going to an organization that was looking at buying a behavioral health EHR and they have, you know, a large group around the big table, several people sitting in the back, all of the people at the table were physicians and the behavioral health professionals were sitting in the back row. And it was clear, I mean, the, the, the dynamics were real clear there about who, who's driving this boat. And they were making the decision about the behavioral health EHR. So it's like, okay, well, this, this, this may be maybe the cart and the horse problem here. Yes. Working at integrated behavioral health and a medical center is behavioral, behavioral health into a primary care setting. Mm -hmm. And as the behavioral health director, I really had to advocate and push to have a seat at the table. Yeah. Um, and be part of the discussion about programmatic uh, concerns. So, you know, I relied on my social work advocacy skills. That's <laughs> <laughs> because you know, the health providers are in the change business, and we are in like the business of talking to people and making people feel comfortable. A lot of medical folks don't. They don't. They don't. Well, some don't see the value of behavioral health, and then some aren't used to us playing in their in their field yeah well in their culture so it's funny though i feel like we've gotten this reputation now of being a catching of children my sense though is that it's a different world right now i mean i have seen a seismic shift mm -hmm. in perceptions around behavioral health and receptivity to trying to take a more integrated approach and whole person approach and so i think we as the mental health community have to sort of just rise to that opportunity and like boldly state our place and yeah. like make it happen because mm -hmm. yeah um because yeah, everyone's experience is going to be better if you have all the right people on the right. <laughs> right. that is a silver lining of the pandemic yeah. right it's like i mean it has brought uh, this to the forefront that you know this is an important problem this is something that we should be thinking about so uh, um, i think we discontinue discussion, you know, uh, we might be uh, able to change uh, the whole things. <laughs> um, remote participants, any questions or comments? Well, you know, one, one thing that uh, to kind of riffing a little bit more off of what Mosin just said that, that the future about integrated care. I, I remember looking at one study, I think it was an Aetna study of a population health problem. And what they identified was that 5% of the enrollees in the health plan uh, consumed 50% of the health care costs. And those people almost invariably had uh, were co-diagnosed with a behavioral health, a chronic behavioral health problem, and some medical problem, diabetes, heart disease, something like that. And that, that you think about that, just, I mean, forget about clinical ethics, you think about anything else. Just from a purely financial point of view, if you don't attend to both of those concurrently, you're going to lose money. And you know, I've seen behavioral health organizations that are trying, are thinking about going at risk on on managed care contracts, and they are just completely clueless about how to manage that on both sides of that equation. I mean, they're going to <clears throat> the behavioral health organizations are going to lose it because they can't they can't manage the the medical care, and you see medical centers going after this stuff similar to what, what our audience talked about, that they're not, not really bringing behavioral health to the table truly. And consequently, they're gonna lose their shirts financially because they're not attending to the behavioral health component. I tell you, dealing with that, that co-diagnosis of a chronic medical problem and a chronic mental health problem, that's, that's a tough area. Diabetes is rampant within people with serious mental illnesses. Um, and you know, managing the two of those together becomes a really challenging problem. Final thoughts or comments? 
Thank you all.